Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast, a Canadian real estate podcast that shows you how to pay off your mortgage sooner and live well while doing it. Now, here's your host, Sean Cooper. Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. I'm Sean Cooper, and it's great to be back for another episode. On today's show, I'll be talking to Judith Kane. Judith is Canada's money coach and has worked in the financial services industry for 27 years. She has worked with hundreds of clients to create a clear picture of their financial situation. She helps her clients build a realistic spending and savings plan through her get out of debt and stay there strategy. In my interview with Judith, we discuss the Ottawa real estate market, using goal setting to achieve financial success, and questions to ask yourself before undertaking a major home renovation. Without further ado, here's my interview with Judith Kane. Hi Judith, how are you doing today? I'm fine, Sean. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Well, thanks for being a guest. It's wonderful to speak with you. You used to live in Toronto, but decided to move to Ottawa. What led you to moving to our nation's capital? How are you enjoying life there? Well, we lived in Toronto and my husband worked for a property company and they had property in Ottawa and they asked if Ian would be interested in moving into Ottawa and he phoned me and he said, what do you think? And I said, let's go. It's an adventure. We'd only been married for a few years. We'd only owned our house for a couple of years. And funny story about the house. Did you know that in the 90s, the early 90s, there was a a massive real estate drop in Toronto and Ottawa? And we bought our house for 170,000 in 1991. And my husband's company at the time bought the house from us because that was their relocation policy. And they ended up selling it for $128,000. So for people who think that there can't be a real estate crash, There was in the early 90s, and it had to do with the interest rates, which were extremely high, 21%, I think was the highest I ever saw, and the interest rates dropped dramatically, and that caused this real estate crash. Yes, certainly the real estate market can slow down, but I guess as long as you're in it for the long haul, then you can ride out those bumps along the way. Well, exactly. And that's why people do use real estate for investment purposes, which is great. But just remember, it's just like any other investment, there are highs and lows. Definitely. And that kind of leads us into our next question, uh, touching on Ottawa a bit more as well. Ottawa is sometimes unfairly characterized as a boring bureaucratic city. I didn't say that, but I definitely heard that from (laughs) some other people. I love Ottawa, but it has a lot to offer. Besides a booming tech sector, it has a higher median household income than Toronto and a more affordable housing market. Just a quick side note, a former coworker of mine recently moved from Toronto to Ottawa since he couldn't afford the housing prices in the GTA. He wanted to buy a spacious house and the opportunity to telecommute, he was able to do that. And with more workplaces allowing that option, more people perhaps might take up that option of moving somewhere more affordable. Judith, why should somebody consider moving to Ottawa, perhaps from Toronto or another city in Canada? It goes back and forth whether companies have people in the office or let them work remotely. As we all know, Yahoo pulled every employee back into the office because they felt that they weren't in control of what was happening with their employees that telecommuted. But I think for my husband, his company is actually moving into a new head office. People have the option to work remotely and about 50% of the people working there took the option to do that because Ottawa is a fantastic place to live. Geographically, it's not very big. You can live outside of the city, buy a house for under $300,000 on a beautiful piece of property and be half an hour from downtown. First part of the LRT is going to be finished this fall and with expansions going on over the next couple of years. Ottawa is a vital city. You can bike from one end of the city to the other. Biking is a huge part of living in Ottawa. We've got festivals. We have... Winterlude. Winterlude. We have Winterlude. We have festivals in the summer. We have festivals in the winter. 
And we've got Ottawa Race Weekend. There are lots of activities to do in Ottawa. In fact, in the high-tech boom, the first high-tech boom, there was a lot of American people who came up to work for companies in Ottawa, and they actually never left because they loved living in Ottawa so much. We have great education. We have great schools. Occasionally, we do get minus 40, but honestly, if that happens once a year, maybe, maybe twice a year. There's lots of snow, so there's tons of winter activities. We've got a professional hockey team. We've got soccer. We've got baseball. It's a great place to live and at a fraction of what it would cost you to live in Toronto or Vancouver. The cost of living is certainly a lot more affordable than Toronto. It sure is. Great. So besides being a homeowner in Ottawa, you're also Canada's money coach. Tell us how you got involved in money coaching. What do you find most rewarding about your career? Well, Sean, I've actually been in the financial services industry for almost 30 years. I started out as a life insurance agent and worked with a company here in Ottawa. And I ended up getting my funds license and then started doing financial planning with them because they were a full service office. So we did investments, insurance, and financial planning. And then in the early 2000s, I left and went out on my own and I created my own office and managed investments, did life insurance. And in 2010, I was walking through the Olympics with my husband. We were there on our 20th anniversary. And I said, you know what? I don't like what I do anymore. What I really like is financial planning. And so I sold my practice and in 2011, took the training to be a money coach. And so now I've moved away from financial planning and I just do money coaching. And I love working with clients, helping them achieve their goals, helping them set goals. Because many people don't even have goals. And I, I love helping them set their goals and kind of getting control over their cash flow and then seeing them achieve their goals. For me, that's better than anything. Oh, totally. So many Canadians struggle with debt. The fact that interest rates have been low for so long and we're moving towards a cashless society certainly hasn't helped. Not only is carrying a lot of debt costly, it can affect your ability to qualify for a mortgage. Can you talk about your get out of debt and stay there strategy that you use with your money coaching clients? Well, some people aren't going to like this, but when clients work with me for the first couple of months, they use cash for their monthly spending. It must be painful. I'm not talking about paying your gas bill or paying your mortgage. What I'm talking about are your expenses. So groceries, gas, pet food, entertainment, dining out, alcohol, those kinds of things that you spend that are kind of variable throughout the month. We set up a cash flow that works for them and they pay for those things with cash for a couple of months. And it's interesting to see what happens with people. Most of my clients create a game out of this and they want to have money left in the envelopes because I use envelopes. Very similar to Gail Vaz Oxlade, only instead of jars, I use envelopes because I think envelopes fit in your purse better than jars. But... (laughs) They have money in their envelopes and they play a game with themselves to see if they can have money left in the envelopes at the end of the month. That's one side. The other side is people say, there's no way that I'm going to be able to just spend this much on groceries or entertainment. And we work together to create a cash flow that works for them. And surprisingly, people seem to be able to spend within their limits. So once they've started working with cash we figure out the rest of their cash flow and we put any extra money possible into paying down debt. And as we're going through this process, because when people work with me, it's a 12 month process. After 12 months, it's just wonderful to see what happens with people's behaviors. It's very similar to not eating properly. You just get into a habit maybe to going to fast food places or not preparing your meals. Spending money is exactly the same way. It's so easy to ring up your line of credit or to use a credit card or to get another credit card because your first credit card is full. So it's just so easy to do that without thinking about it. So what we're doing is we're flipping that behavior on its butt and we're forcing people to be way more conscious about where they're spending their money. And I'm curious, in order for people to be successful, I guess they have to be 100% committed. Do you have any other advice for people to be successful with a money coach? I think that, you know, questioning everything you buy, 
I really believe that if you are looking, you know, I had this discussion with someone yesterday about a toaster. Do you fix the toaster or do you throw it away and you just buy a new toaster because you can buy a toaster for $20? Here's my philosophy on that. I think $20 is still $20. And if you do that five times over a month, that's $100. And if you do that every month, that's $1,200 that you've just kind of said, well, I could just buy another one for $20. And, and it's now cost you $1,200. There's a really neat growing, something that's happening in, in big cities is that they're coming up with these things called repair cafes. So if you have a small appliance or an article of clothing that needs to be repaired, you can actually go to this repair cafe and get it repaired. So instead of having to throw that toaster away, if you just hang on to it until the next repair cafe, you take it down there and you can get it repaired. That's great. I mean, as long as it's a reasonable price to get it repaired and it doesn't cost as much as a new unit, then I definitely consider doing that next time. Exactly. Well, in some cases, it doesn't cost anything. Oh, wow. Sometimes what you can do is you can join the cafe as a member you can go down whenever you want. And they also repair clothing. If you have to sew a button on, or if you have a pair of pants that need to be hemmed, or you've split the knee open, I know that that's a popular style to wear pants that have ripped knees, but in some cases that's mm -hmm. not always the case. Or for men who carry change or wallets in their pocket, they rip the little corner of their pocket. Some of the repair cafes actually have people there who repair clothes too. Just think about what you're throwing away, what you're buying, what you're doing with your money. I think that once people become more conscious of that, then it makes it easier for them to stay out of debt and to start achieving the goals, whether it's saving money in a TFSA or saving money towards buying a house. And that actually segues into our next question. So similar to me, you're a big fan of goal setting. How do you use goal setting to help your clients achieve their financial goals, like saving towards the down payment on a house and burning their mortgage? Here's my philosophy on that. And it's one of the reasons why I, I stopped selling life insurance and investments because I really wanted to focus on goals. You can't decide where to put your money in investments or even how much to put in investments or how much insurance or what kind of insurance to buy unless you know why you're doing it. As Simon Sinek says, what, what is your why? I start with goals and I spend hours, a few hours with clients setting down their goals. And we have short-term goals, which are sort of within 12 months. We have medium-term goals that are within five years. And then we have longer-term goals. And we really work on those goals. Now, money coaching tends to focus on the short-term goals, which is the 12 months. But once you have your goals set, then the rest of it comes easy because you look at your assets and your liabilities and you look at your ability to earn income and your expenses. And if your goal is to travel around the world every year and you're only making $45,000 a year, then we need to focus more on the goals and be more Definitely. realistic about the goals. But goal setting is a huge part of the work that I do. For myself speaking personally, if I didn't set goals about my finances, whether it was saving to buy a house, saving money to pay for my education or even pay off my mortgage, I wouldn't have accomplished it. I would have just probably spent all my money instead of paying myself first and putting it in a dedicated savings account, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So that's what worked personally for me. And I'm a big fan of goal setting as well. Yeah. I, and I agree. I mean, I worked with clients last night and they said, we don't have as much money in our checking account as we like. And I said, well, look at all the other accounts that you're saving money in. So the emergency fund, the travel fund, the clothing fund, the Christmas fund, and it totaled up to $22,000. So I said, you do still have the money. What we've done is segregated it so that when you need to pay your property tax, the money is in the account. You just have to go into that account and pay it. That's a great approach. Certainly, I think people should look at approaching their money that way. Mm -hmm. Great. So we've probably heard it many times. Real estate is probably the single biggest financial transaction of your lifetime. But unfortunately, there are some mistakes that you can make when buying a home. So can you walk us through some common home buying mistakes that you've seen with your clients and how these could have been avoided? Well, I think the biggest mistake I see is buying too much house too soon. For couples who are young and just getting started in life, it seems to be the trend to see if they can buy the biggest four bedroom, two car garage house that they can afford. But what happens is they're just getting started. They don't have kids yet and they buy this big house. 
And then they start having kids and those kids start doing activities. And all of a sudden the mortgage on this big house is now becoming pretty much of a stressor on mm -hmm. their lives. Back to goal setting, you know, what kind of house do you want to live in now? But what else is going to go on? And this is something that the mortgage brokers don't ask because it's really not their job. I mean, their job is to make sure that, you know, or the real estate agent is to make sure that the person gets the house they want. But really, you need to talk to someone and say, what do you think is going to happen in the next five years? Do you see yourself having children? Do you see yourself traveling a lot? If all of those things are there, then maybe you should look at the kind of house that you're buying and a smaller house would make sense until you decide that you're going to have five kids and you do need to move into a bigger house. But I think that that's the biggest mistake I see is it. And, and you have to fill this house once you've bought it. Once you've bought a big house with four bedrooms or three bedrooms, you have to fill it with furniture. And, you know, that's another expense. And you have to, you feel that you need to do some landscaping. And I think that people just need to take a step back and look at what they want in their life besides a house. I guess you have to realize that the first property you buy doesn't have to be your forever home. And also consider the ongoing monthly costs of maintaining the house. That includes the utilities, property taxes, home insurance, and of course, the big one, repairs and maintenance. And speaking from personal experience, I had my roof damaged a couple times this year from a windstorm that I didn't even expect. So you certainly have to have emergency savings for that. And you also don't want too much of your monthly cash flow to be eaten up because then you can't do the fun stuff in life, like going for a vacation or going out to restaurants. And I'm sure your significant other won't be very happy if you have to spend every single Friday night inside because so much of your cash flow is being eaten up by your big house that you decide to buy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's true. And I, I think the other thing that people need to think about is when they're looking at a mortgage, a lot of the lenders will offer a home equity line of credit and they feel that that's their money and it's not their money. It's the bank's money. So if you buy a house, for example, a big house that has an unfinished basement, you think, oh, I've got this home equity line of credit. I can just have someone renovate the basement and finish it. Well, if you actually don't need to use the space in that basement for living space, then think about whether you want to borrow the money because that's exactly what you're doing. And I, I wish people understood home equity lines of credit when they got their mortgages more than they do. Certainly. I mean, a home equity line of credit can be used in a smart way, for example, to renovate your basement and be able to rent it out and bring in money from a tenant. But don't think it's the wisest choice to use that money to go on vacation or buy a boat, which I've unfortunately heard from some people. So yes. I guess as long as your use of the home equity line of credit is good and it helps improve your net worth, then that might make sense. But certainly going on a vacation or buying a boat, I, I don't think that would be the case with that. Yes, I totally agree with you. Besides hockey, something else that Canadians love is home renovations. Everyone loves watching those home renovation shows on TV these days. I'm guilty of that as well. But not all renovations add value to your property. What are some important questions to ask yourself before undertaking a major home renovation? And feel free to speak from personal experience as well. Well, I'm so glad that you asked that question. So here's how I do it with home renovations. I tell people to figure out how much money that they're willing to spend. Let's go back to the basement and say, you do need the room for living space. So you're going to renovate your basement. How much are you willing to spend? So how much can you afford to finance and how much are you willing to spend on that basement? That's where the number should come from. It shouldn't come from calling up the contractor, having three people come in, give you quotes and say, okay, this is the contractor I want to work with and having them come up with the price. Because if your goal is to only spend $60,000 on the basement and the quotes come in at $80,000, where are you going to get that $20,000 from when you haven't planned to pay $80,000? I think you need to go to the contractor and say, I have $60,000. What is it that I can have done in my basement that will make it a great living space? You're the client, you're in control, and you tell the contractor how much money you have to spend as opposed to the other way around. So that's my first advice on renovations. And my second advice, and yes, Sean, you know I've renovated my house, is that it will cost you more that you should have a contingency in there if you make changes on anything. 
because that's going to cost you money. I upgraded the doors in my house and I have 16 doors and that was an increased expense. It definitely. And if you've watched some of those show renovation shows, when they start tearing down walls, sometimes they find other hidden problems within the walls, whether it be mold or knob and tube wiring or asbestos. So definitely have that contingency fund because you never know when a home renovation will run over budget. And it seems like almost all of them run over budget these days. It's true. And you know, Sean, you brought up a good point. When we bought this house, now we have a septic system and we have a well. And we're not on city services. So when we came to look at this house and we put an offer in, we actually hired five different inspectors. We hired a home inspector, a septic inspector, a water and well inspector. We hired an electrician to come in and do an inspection. And we hired a foundation person. And we spent more money. It cost us $1,500 for all of those people. But you know, it was the best investment we made because we knew exactly how much it was going to cost us to fix this house so that we could move into it. And you don't have to just stick with your building inspector. If you're moving into, especially an older house, if you're moving into a house and you have concerns that it may be knob and tube wiring, the home inspector looks inside, he opens up, you know, he may pull off an outlet and look inside. But an electrician knows other things to look for. The plumbers know other things to look for a little bit more in depth than a home inspector. I highly recommend everybody have their home inspected first, but I think that it may make sense to spend a little extra money so that you don't have any surprises if you think that you're going to renovate down the line. Definitely. And don't just have your knowledgeable handyman uncle walk through the property and give his two cents because it certainly <laughs> is worth hiring an expert. Yes, absolutely. A certified we, expert. Yes, a certified expert to come and do your home inspection. But think about going a little bit farther. You know, especially the older homes in Toronto, we lived in Toronto for many years, and the older homes in Toronto often have foundation issues. So bringing in a foundation person to come and have a look around your house and just give you their opinion about whether they, they see a crack, does that look like a big crack or a little crack, or is it just on the face of it? I think that it's really important that you do your due diligence and it will save you money in the long run, don't you think? It definitely, I think it's money well spent. It's better than waking up one day and seeing that your house is kind of sinking into the ground. I've certainly seen <laughs> that with some of the houses in the beach area in Toronto. I wouldn't want to be a homeowner for one of those houses. Or the leak coming through your dining room uh, ceiling and you're wondering where that's coming from. And it actually could have something to do with your foundation, believe it or not. It's been wonderful to have you on the show today, Judith. Before I let you go, is there anything of interest that you're working on that you'd like to share with our listeners? I'm happy to be on the podcast, Sean. I really appreciate you having me on. I am a money coach and I do work virtually. So I have clients across Canada and I also have them now in six different countries, which is wow. kind of interesting. I'm available for a consultation. If people are interested, they can visit my website, judithkane.com. Great. And I'll be sure to in include that in the show notes. So thanks so much for being on the show, Judith. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Earn Your Mortgage Podcast. Besides being a podcast host and money coach, I'm also a licensed mortgage broker. If you or anyone you know, family, friends, co-workers, or neighbors could ever use any unbiased mortgage advice or a second opinion, feel free to reach out. You can reach me by email at seancooperwriter.com at gmail.com, or you can call or text me at 647-867-3711. Also, be sure to head on over to www.seancooperwriter.com and sign up for my free weekly newsletter. As a small token of my appreciation, you'll be able to download my ultimate mortgage checklist on choosing the perfect mortgage. You can also sign up for a free one-on-one 15-minute -on -one money coaching consultation with yours truly. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you burn your mortgage sooner too. Once again, thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. 
Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating. Until next time, happy mortgage burning!